McCoy um, as a recorded session. Today we're going to talk um, a little bit more about the evidence-based intimate partner violence screening tools and interventions. Um, I know that this session was um, advertised as IPV coding and documentation, and we will go over some of the numerator and denominator and GIPRA um, terms later in the um, presentation. I did pull all of the um, more clinical guidelines forward, so just to make sure that we get through that content. Um, we hit on that a little bit in our very um, first session with Nakui, and there was a lot of interest in having a more in-depth discussion about those clinical um, screening tools. So we're going to hit those a little bit more, um, so I'll take a little bit more time to go through those tools today. If you have any questions, just put them in the um, chat box, and um, the um, Mark will um, alert me to the questions if I don't see them later. So today we're going to discuss current recommendations regarding IPV screening, identifying pertinent groups of patients that may be at a higher risk for experiencing IPV, recognize at least four intimate partner violence screening tools, and compare available IPV screening tool features and pertinent considerations for clinical use. And then at the very end, we will um, go a little bit more in depth on the GIPRA, GRAMA IPV measures and um, have a, a chance to ask questions about any of the content. So I just want to start off with her, the update to um, in May of 2018 from the U.S. Preventative um, Services Task Force, and just um, you know a little um, just for the information about this presentation. So I listed most of my resources at the bottom of the um, slide. So if you want to go more in depth on um, what we were discussing, you can actually go into um, the presentation slides and download them. And then um, there's links or you know copy and paste the link to the resource for more information. Um, you can also ask me a question. I, can, um, I, I might be able to answer it without you going there. But um, in May of 2018, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force did update their recommendations for IPV screening. And so there really wasn't any change in general recommendations. It is recommended to screen um, females from 14 to and on up for IPV. And what they say is in the reproductive years um, for females. But they also made, there, there were several other recommendations in um, kind of the small print, I would say, of that, rec of that um, a source, which I, I do want to point out because it, it um, may sway you as to your clinical practice and actually who you screen and how you screen um, your patients. Um, there really wasn't any changes in the actual instruments found to be reasonably accurate, and we're going to go over some of these in in depth. The HARC, the HIT, the EHIT, GVS, and the WASP were some of um, a few that were mentioned in 2013 guidelines and were also found to be um, reasonably accurate again in May of 2018. Um, we're also going to talk about another instrument called the danger assessment, which is um, it, it, it's a, a tool um, that runs to lethality risk. It's the a risk of a patient um, actually becoming a victim of homicide. And so we're going to talk about that one a little bit more in depth as well. Um, the, for interventions, ongoing support services that focus on counseling and home visits were actually found to be um, much more effective. Um, there was a large study about home visiting um, programs. I'm not sure if any of the urban um, organizations um, support any type of home visiting, whether it's, um, you know, if you have CHRs or um, community representatives that may, may do outreach or transportation or anything like that. Um, that was found to be a really effective way of um, offering services for intimate partner violence. And we'll kind of talk about some of the barriers that obviously are the safety issues in doing home visits where it intersects with IPV. 
um, in, in this presentation as well, but it, it, it was something that um, I was surprised that had such a, a, a positive effect. Um, addressing multiple risk factors besides IPV, so when um, they found when there is a positive depression or positive alcohol or drug abuse, oftentimes um, screening for IPV is, is it comes, you know, <laughs> has a comorbid um, problem or issue that has to be addressed. And then also including parenting support for new mothers. Um, you know, during the, and we'll talk about during IPV during pregnancy and, and then supporting new parents um, during that really stressful time. Potential harms of screening and intervention research. So this one was kind of interesting. Um, as healthcare providers, we often, um, it, it's an issue that comes up that we think if we screen somebody, um, you know, if they walk out with this education material or if we mention it, and other family members here, we're always worried that um, are we causing harm or are we putting that patient at risk because now other people know that they um, potentially reported this. Um, and there was um, actually a total of seven research studies that um, USP um, reported on and that were rated as good or fair quality and they found that no harm um, came from either screening or intervention services in those particular research studies. So that's something also significant um, to mention. So we, there's another, besides screening, and we're going to talk about all the screening tools, there is another approach which includes universal education. And universal education is, um, something that we do teach in our three-part, the IHS three-part series that um, I, I included under the IPV training doc. There's a link to a three-part series that you, you may um, want to have your staff or yourself um, partake in that particular screening. And that relies heavily on universal education. So, and that means that we screen everybody usually, you know, 13 and up or even younger if there is some risk factor present there. And, and both female and male um, receive the universal education. It just acknowledges that violence is common across all age groups and genders. And then although most data relates to female victimization, it, and we actually do have data that says American Indian Alaska Native men as well as patients in bisexual or same-sex relationships we experience IPV and other forms of violence at higher rates than national averages. So um, it's really important to recognize that in the population that we serve, um, the, the risk is fairly high. So we should actually be educating or screening everybody. Um, and not all of our tools are validated for um, different groups of people, but um, the issue does cross um, all of our problems. So universal education is also effective. Um, there is, and I put in links to um, articles at the bottom of the slide if you want to read up more on those links. And this evaluation of school-based peer facilitated healthy relationship programs for at-risk adolescents was one article that I wanted to um, talk about because it, it, it found that educating adolescents either um, about IPV was very effective. They found that if they received this education even as a, in a curriculum-based type program or just education through their healthcare provider, that they were both less likely to become victims of IPV and they were also less likely to be perpetrators of IPV. So it's very effective when we start talking about, well, how young are we going to educate and how young should we target? And, and you know, um, like on the GIPRA IPV measure, it says 14, you know, and over, over. And we also get this kind of pushback sometimes, like, we think that's really young. Um, but it, it is effective um, to both screen and educate. Um, even before somebody really gets into a relationship. And that's one article that um, it, it was very interesting to read, so I left the link there. 
And then there's also the um, intimate partner violence by Shields in that 2015 date. And I got that off as a clinical key. And it and that also lends itself to um, the the effectiveness of universal education and why, you know, everybody is really at risk and we have to target all of our patients, not just females 14 and over and in the reproductive um, ages. So who do we target and why? And obviously in my last slide, I you know, I really do believe that everybody should be educated and targeted. But there are some um, populations that are at higher risk. And obviously um, DIPA, um does usually identify the most at risk um, category. You know, even in you know, like our colonoscopy and um, mammogram, you know, they, they really hone in on the ages and the genders that that are most at risk. But um, so GIPRA, the ITV, it's 14 and over and it's only measures for females. But during pregnancy, um, it, they are especially um, um, at risk for ITV. So it is, is recommended during pregnancy um, like the GIPRA is once per year in that patient, um, you know, health care screening that, or, or contact they should be screened. In pregnancy, the actual best practice is to screen at every contact during that pregnancy, um, especially for adolescent patients, unplanned pregnancy, um, financial hardship, um, and entrance to the health care system in the second or third trimester as well. So that's kind of a delay in um, healthcare seeking. And so if, if you are having um, a patient that's pregnant in the second or third trimester, they especially need um, the education and the screening at every contact thereafter. Um, with STD and HIV um, treatment and screening, any incidents as well as repeat treatment of, you should also ask about ITV. That is um, a high risk group. We often see um, patients because they can't um, maybe, um, they may not um, report sexual assault or um, reproductive coercion. Sorry, that's a, that is a term um, as a part of ITV, especially in adolescent relationships with reproductive coercion. And so they're also then exposed to STDs or HIV. And so whenever they're coming in for a repeat screening or um, repeat treatment or the very first treatment, we always want to have a, um, a good conversation about ITV, either universal education or the screening um, with each of those contacts. Alcohol and substance abuse positive is also a high correlation with ITV. So every any time and and the suicide attempts and and you might um, have that as like the depression screening. So really, whenever you're screening for depression or alcohol substance abuse, you should also be screening for ITV as a possible um, issue that is also going on. Parents of under immunized children have also been found to um, have a higher incidence of ITV and. In, in, I believe it's the second article here, it really talks about that, um, or delayed um, health seeking for screening for um, children is often um, something or a red flag that you should be screening the parents for ITV when they come in. And that, and you know, when we talk about later about um, really good interventions or, or possible improvements to interventions, doing IPV screening during immunization clinics or um, education during um, for adolescents during physical, like the sports physical time, is a really good time to just work it in as a routine part of your practice. So that's a really good way to um, address not only IPV, but also screen for alcohol substance and, and depression. So when we get into some of the ITV screening tools, and this is um, some of the really technical part of the clinical um, 
things that I wanted to um, get into is uh, sometimes it's assumed that healthcare providers, whether it's a mental health care provider, a nurse, or a doctor, have already been trained on how to screen and what t screening tools to use. Honestly, a lot of us, you know, in our bachelor, even in my own bachelor degree program, I, I really wasn't taught, you know, this is the best screening tool to use, or this is how you should do it. It's really something that is an on-the-job training, and it's a medical decision of your facility of which screening tool you are going to use, and then to get comfortable with that screening tool. And it, like I say, it's my spiel. You know, now I I've just done it so often that I I am very comfortable doing it. But many healthcare providers are not comfortable doing it. So what ends up happening is we do not pick a specific screening tool for our facility and train our staff on that, we often come up with the, you know, a really general question, are you feeling safe at home? You know, and that's the extent of our screening. And we know that that doesn't really get to um, um, a positive response if, if IPV is going on at the home. Maybe they feel safe at their home right now, but their, their uh, perpetrator is not living in their home. You know, so there's a lot of different um, nuances to just a one question um, screening tool or, or a very general screening and then, you know, marking negative in a, in a very hurried manner. Um, it's not likely to garner um, some of these, the results of these other screening tools. So we want to look at those and we really want to get together as a facility and ask you know, okay, which one of these screening tools pertains to my population and, and which one are we going to decide to use? So I just wanted to, you know, open up the first polling question related to um, if you are using a screening tool. Mark, would you be able to open up that polling question? So has your staff been trained to use a specific IPV screening tool? I was just interested to know um, if you're at your facility, if you have a specific screening tool in your staff that your staff uses. And we'll just um, take a minute here to find some about, more about our group practices. So we have about 19 participants. If you could, you know, just hit the yes or no button on on the um, polling question. It really helps us to kind of see where we're at before we start um, getting into the screening tool. Anyone want to jump in there? Okay, I don't want to take too much time with this, so we can um, close the answer and the poll. It looks like about 85% said no, um, and, and one participant does have um, use of a specific IPD screening tool. And unfortunately, that's not um, um, something that's unique to urban Indian organizations. But, you know, there's many facilities, healthcare facilities, that have not um, trained their staff to, t to use a specific tool. And that uh -huh. itself, you know, later we'll talk about, you know, why people don't, or healthcare providers don't um, screen. And this is one of the reasons why, is because they're, they're unsure of how to screen. So we're going to look at um, the first one is the HIT screening tool. And I just want to um, also um, point you down to this very first document under the presentation slides. It's called IPV, um, IPV and SVS screen, or SV sexual violence screening PDF. So this is a booklet, and it actually has the actual 
you know, streaming tools in it um, that you can either copy off or you can, um, you know, put into a Word document or, you know, I don't know how you have your streaming all um, done at each of your facilities, but you can also take these and put them into our PMS templates if you, if you would like. Um, but they're actually listed, like the questions are listed there with how to administer the tool um, in that booklet. So one of them that you will find in that booklet is the HITS, and it's, um, it's just a four-question tool, you know, physically, does your partner physically hurt you, insult you, or talk down to you, threaten you with harm, or scream at you and curse at you. So it's a five-point Riker scale, you know, using never, rarely, sometimes, fairly often, and then it, it gives you, you know, a positive um, is greater than or equal, equal to 10.5. And there is a Spanish version. And then I want you to, to pay particular attention to the setting and population because you're not going to find um, actually any that are have been validated for the American Indian Alaska Native population specifically. So, um, but if you want to pay attention to, you know, if they're tested in women and men and the different versions that you will find with some of these. Because we're only going to go through a handful that were recommended by, you know, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, but there are others in this booklet. So um, the sensitivity and the specificity tested is also listed for um, each one of these tools. And that's something that you your um, health care providers and mental health care providers are going to want to consider when they're, they're um, picking a screening tool. So, um, the next one, and then I, there's also a link to another um, booklet besides the one um, that I included the whole document here, and that's the 2009 Intimate Partner Abuse Violence Screening Tool. So that's another one that has listed several different screening tools, and you can find the whole screening tool um, on that document as well. So the, another very popular one is the WASP, WASP, and the WASP of us, the short form. So some of these have a longer form, and, and then there, there is another short form. So if, uh, and with a lot of these shorter forms, if they're positive on the shorter form, it often recommends you to then do the long form. Um, the WASP has eight questions, and it's and we want to consider that how many questions because that is one of the also one of the factors of why healthcare providers sometimes elect not to screen for IPD. So the first thing is they're uncomfortable with it with the training because there was no training or they weren't given direction. The other one is the time that it takes. So we want to find a tool that is not too long, but yet gives um, you know gets at the questions and actually. Um, has um, hits a few different behaviors, you know, that are considered IGD. So I, this loss, the short form, is a very popular one. Um, it it con consists of the first two questions only. Um, positive is a lot of tension or, or great difficulty. And then, so if you did positive on the two questions, then of course you would do all of the questions after that. It's been tested in white African American and Latino women. There is a Spanish version for um, the WASP and the WASP SF. And um, the WASP SF plus injury location compared to self report of IPD sensitivity was 92%. Um, the sensitivity was 92%. The specificity was 56%. Once that we tested sensitivity and specificity, of the WASP, that's like the short form, plus the PDS. Um, and it got a little bit um, higher with the specificity of that tool. So the next one um, is the PDS, which is also um, one that I find is used a lot in different settings, and it's because it's a, a shorter um, version. It has three questions, and it has a, um, a little bit different or it hits on a few different behaviors. So the, have you been hit, kissed, punched, or otherwise hurt by someone in the past year? 
that ties it to, you know, not just any time in your lifetime in the past year? And do you feel safe in your current relationship? And is there a partner from a previous relationship who is making you feel unsafe now? So that gets more into the stalking, um, which is a high prevalence among American Indian Alaska Native um, population as well. It has been tested with women and men with a range of ethnicity and socioeconomic statuses. So that's another one that makes why it makes it popular. So it has had a lot of testing. But the last one that I did want to talk about, which wasn't specifically mentioned in the U.S. Um, Preventative Task Force um, recommendation, is, is the danger assessment. And the danger assessment is a little bit different because it is the only assessment that actually um, assesses a woman's potential. Oh, and not only a woman, we're going to talk about the other um, populations that I was tested in potential danger of homicide by an intimate male partner. So the 20 item um, assessment, the danger assessment, is actually in this ICD, this first document that I, I, I um, included. However, there was an update to that. So I did um, download that actual update. So if you go into this first document, do not use that danger assessment that's in there. If you go down, the danger assessment screening tool, it's 372 um, kilobytes. That is the most recent tool. And um, we actually, IHS um, um, subcontracted with Johns Hopkins University through ISIN. And on November 21st, we are going to have a special um, learning, it's a three and a half hour learning session on how to administer this tool, this particular tool. And um, it's going to be for the American Indian Alaska Native population or, or health care providers working with them. So it's free. And it's, um, if you go on to um, the danger assessment flyer, 315 kilobytes that document, there is a link to go to tribalforensicshealthcare.org. And you register for an account. And you can view that three and a half hour um, learning session webinar by Dr. Campbell, the, the researcher and creator of this tool. And she's also going to go over a new tool that's being validated right now for American Indian and Alaska Native populations and um, as a part of that webinar. But the, the majority of the webinar is going to be on the danger assessment. So the 20 item assessment tool actually does take a little bit more time. Um, so there is a DA5, which is the short form, and then um, there are other forms of the danger assessment, which she will go over in depth in that three and a half hour um, webinar for you know different populations, but it's different populations. And it's so this danger assessment um, has an activity within in the the questionnaire where the patient actually marked down on a calendar um, when and what happened on, on each day. You know, they go back over, you know, the past year. And they, that part of the tool, although it's time consuming, um, you do have to sit down and take a little bit more time with that patient. It, it serves as a really good educational tool for the patient to really look at how often this happens to them and the severity of the abuse. So, and then the other thing that, why this danger assessment tool is unique is that based on the score, they do actually give you a tool that recommends a specific intervention for that scoring range. So, um, it's very prescriptive, which is something that, um, I think we sometimes need, you know, at the higher scores, I think, you know, it will tell you it's actually recommended to, um, you know, encourage the patient to call the police, you know, or assist them to call the police at that time. And, and um, or, you know, we're going to do a safety plan or, you know, it, or education or, or whatever. But the, but the weighted scoring tool is, um, something that is taught in that three and a half hour training um, webinar that we will have available for free through tribalforensics.org. 
healthcare.org on November 21st. And then if you can't um, be there or listen to it on November 21st, it will be under the recorded webinar tab on that our site. So I just want to make everybody aware of that. I, um, although you guys do not have to adhere, the Urban Indian Organizations do not have to adhere to IHS policy, we did include the danger assessment in IHS policy under Chapter 31 for IQB um, and sexual assault. So whenever there is a positive, so let's say we wanted to use a two question, you know, validated screening tool, and they, they were a positive, if in the IHS facilities, if they're a positive under any other screening tool, the danger assessment screening tool has to be administered. So that's you know, you don't have to do the DA5 or the, you know, choose this this longer assessment as your first line. But it is for positive. We we have it in our policy that this one is a must um, because there are unique um, and validated reasons to use this tool. So um, that is written into um, IHM, the IHM chapter 29 and 31 for use of this one. And then you can go to Johns Hopkins School of Nursing um, and we have a danger assessment website where you can find all of this information and some of the research behind this tool there. And, and Dr. Campbell will also just talk about it on her um, webinar on the 21st as well. So we kind of talked about clinical factors to consider. The time to complete the screening obviously is one of the things why people um, facilities usually don't choose the danger assessment right up front. They'll do the BA5 and then the BA20 if they're positive for the BA5 or the WASP or the PDF in the tool and then the, consider doing the danger assessment tool. Also, what type of ITV? So there's physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, and reproductive coercion. So there are some tools that we which wasn't talked about in the two that we talked about today, but actually are um, talked about more with adolescent screening tools for IPV. And if that's a population that you have a higher contact with, you will want to consider um, a tool that that does ask about reproductive coercion. If you're not familiar with reproductive coercion, it's often um, talked about and are taught in like safe dating curriculum programs um, as a as a potential issue with adolescent um, dating violence. So that that is one that I wanted to mention because it's often not considered um, when picking out an IPD screening tool. And then healthcare provider training. So that was the number one thing that was actually listed when um, there's been several studies on why healthcare care providers feel uncomfortable with screening for IPD. The number one um, reason was because they didn't have any training on how to do it. So um, I just want to point that out that we do need ongoing training. And like in the IPD um, chapter 31, it is an annual requirement for healthcare providers and IHS facilities to have that training just because we know the more training we get, the more comfortable our providers get in um, actually discussing IPD, whether it's universal education or employing one of these screening tools. Um, is there any questions so far? So I think we kind of went over the, uh, why um, IHM has the, uh, specifically says, you know, we should use the danger and lethality risk assessment tool, but also we should be um, considering strangulation as well. Um, another um, issue that's been coming up more and more in IPD um, Professional circles is traumatic brain injury and the effects of traumatic brain injury over, um, you know, several um, incidences of IPD injuries. So, and and that is another thing that is becoming to be more of um, a requirement of screening is just to to screen also for traumatic brain injuries or traumatic brain injuries effects. Um, and 
triangulation is specifically asked about in the danger and lethality risk assessment tool. So not all, um, well, none of those other, you know, shorter versions ask about triangulation, but the danger assessment does. So that's another consideration in um, possibly using the danger and lethality risk assessment tool, at least for your positive. Um, so another thing that we go through in the chapter 31, which is our IPV chapter and ISS policy, is be ready to intervene. You know, screening and um, getting the conversation started is just the very first step. So we have to also train our staff on safety plans. I, you know, as a nurse, I was, <laughs> it's something that I ran away from, I was scared. You know, I was like, oh, I'm not qualified to do that. I, you know, get a social worker, get a mental health provider. But if you don't have those resources, you know, at your clinic or at your facility, it is something that you can train your staff to do and, and to um, be able to discuss with your patients. There's a lot of, and I'm going to give you a couple of resources for your staff to um, come up with kind of generic safety plans that you then um, fill in. Um, or you can come up with safety plans that are specific to your local resources. And of course, you know, all your safety plans should um, have a realistic available resources that they can access, you know, at any time. Um, but I'll, I'll show you a simple one in the, one of these next slides. But that's something that also don't neglect that, you know, or just um, perceive that your staff is probably knows how to um, talk to a patient about safety plans. It's also something that they might not be comfortable with at all and need training on. Um, victim advocacy contact information. So some um, facilities may have, you know, general like 1-800 numbers and, and things like that, and those are very good. If you if that's all you have, I would really um, recommend the Native American the helpline. And I have a um, a later slide on that service, but they are the people that are staffed that particular helpline. Um, are very familiar with tribal communities and resources available in nationwide in different tribal communities. So they have a large database and they can actually hook them up with um, several different types of organizations for um, local resources. I actually called um, the Native Helpline to, um, you know, just as a healthcare provider to find out what they had. And I was impressed. I, I asked them um, about several different communities nationwide, and they gave me the nearest child advocacy center. They gave me the nearest, you know, domestic violence shelter that was available, and they gave me options about, you know, like how far, you know, a victim would have to travel to get to a certain shelter or whatever. Um, and in some cases, even transportation options. So. That one I would recommend. Also, if you have shelter contact information, and keep in mind that a lot of shelters have very strict rules on who they will accept. So um, just just um, have enough resources that that the patient that you're you know responding to can actually access. And then for forensic examination referral, a lot of times um, when IPV doesn't. Um, involve sexual assault, those patients are less likely to be referred to a forensic exam, but they should be. It's a best practice, but we actually have um, an IPV forensic examiner course, so it, it, it deals with collecting and documenting injury that doesn't involve sexual assault, but they should, still should be done um, for IPV. And so they should be referred. So if you are developing your policies, you know, find out, you know, where your nearest forensic exam is available. If you're not doing them on site, um, where can IPV that um, patients that haven't um, in, had a sexual assault, can they still go there? And will they document their, their injuries appropriately? Um, and that might take some conversation with them to actually find out. You know, you may find out that, no, they don't do this, but this other hospital will. Um, additional considerations. Um, I'm unsure if some of your sites do um, some form of home visiting or transportation services 
um, where they're alone, you know, with the patient or family. Um, but that was found to be a very effective form of intervention for intimate partner violence. It was um, a way to have a, um, a lasting more to establish trust with the family and the patient and to offer different interventions and to set goals with that patient. So, but with that, you know, there's safety considerations with that. Um, many facilities that do do home visiting um, have employed like partner um, policies where they have, they don't go out alone or they, um, they meet in a public place and maybe not in the home if there's um, safety considerations in the home. Um, of course, you know, we also have to talk about mandatory reporting when we're talking about IPV screening. And this is something that uh, as a sexual assault examiner, a forensic examiner, you know, we, we're well aware that even before we start our um, clinical interaction with the patient, one of my first conversations is, uh, you know, a full disclosure and telling my patient that I, I am a mandatory reporter. So before I even start my whole spiel about, you know, discussing universal education about ICD or sexual assault, I do tell them, you know, if any of, of your um, our conversation, you know, comes up um, where I think that a, a child or a vulnerable adult has been injured or has a risk of being injured, I am a mandated reporter. So right off the bat, they know that about our, our future interaction. Um, there is no federal federal mandate to report IPV or domestic violence. However, on the state side, which um, some of your urban organizations are in the state jurisdiction, there are some states that do require mandated reporters to report IPV. So you have to know um, your state guidelines um, as well as your federal guidelines. If you're on a federal um, federal land, you can contact consult with your legal, you know, advisors, IHS, you know, we always say, you know, you have to consult with o OGC for additional guide guidelines, but you're really going to want to know your state guidelines as well because it varies nationally. I, I believe there, I, I think it's less than 10, but there, there are several states that require um, IPV or domestic violence to be reported to police. Um, and, and, and just making sure that your patient knows from the, from the get-go that you are a mandated reporter and abuse involving minors or vulnerable adults is reportable. Um, Self-determination is also a consideration with um, um, healthcare providers. They um, may get to the point where they're frustrated, especially if a patient comes in time and time and again um, reporting, you know, some kind of abuse or they're very worried about the patient, but the patient, you know, refuses any help. That if they're an adult, that is their right. And so we, we just have to try, try again, and keep educating and keep offering. Um, but there, that um, frustration really weighs down on healthcare providers to the point that they may stop um, addressing the issue with the patient. Um, but so to talk about that in some of your training or, or to employ training that does talk about that is often very helpful as well. And so that that is um, talked about in our three-part series under the intervention. I think it's the last series. And that three-part series flyer is um, listed under IPV training, the IPV training document in the presentation slide. It'll give a link to register for that um, that particular training. That was, that's the training that's very um, heavily dependent or encourages universal education as the intervention. So these are some patient education resources. How we're in the previous slide, we're talking about you know we have to be ready to intervene. One of the things that, that helps your facility get ready to intervene is actually have a patient education resource, something you can hand to the patient that they can either take home or have in, in their vehicle or, or just a resource um, numbers or resource location um, so they can take home with them. 
there's several that um, are very helpful. The Futures Without Violence, that if you go into that link, you can order for very low cost. I think it's just the shipping, but there is American Indian, Alaska Native focused um, palm cards. And they actually, I think in the three-part series, they actually use those um, in our educational series. And I think they got those from Futures Without Violence. You can order those and have stick your sticker on your healthcare facilities um, on the back of them. Also, the Strong Hearts Native Helpline, and that's the one that I was talking about, that if you're going to use a national helpline, this is a very good one to use. Um, very impressed with their staff and how familiar they are with tribal communities. They have pamphlets that they'll mail you out for free. So if you um, contact them, at, you know, they sent me a whole box for free. Mending the Sacred Group is also a really good, um, it has several different forms of either pamphlets or palm cards. And they also have ones that are geared towards adolescents as well as futures without violence as too. Um, and then the, I also want to mention the Department of Homeland Security, the Blue Campaign, has trafficking, human trafficking um, resources that are free and that can be mailed out. Um, it, you may have to pay for the shipping. I can't remember on that one, but it's a very nominal cost um, for them. I mentioned that because often um, with human people um, that are experiencing human trafficking, often see the trafficker as a significant other. So they may, um, um, in your discussion, talk about their significant uh -huh. other in an ITV related issue, and as you get into the factors surrounding that, you may recognize it actually as human trafficking. So um, that's why I listed that as a patient resource. I know I'm coming up on the hour, and um, I have several slides to get through, so I, I think that we have um, done like a half an hour, so I might, for questions, so I might run a little bit into that. This intervention um, safety planning, the, the link for this, I, I listed this, and you can Google these. There's, there's several more, but I like this particular safety planning. It, it had a lot of really good general information, and then you can, um, you know, write in different, you know, you can kind of um, help the patient check off what is particular in their situation. So it was just an example of a, um, a really simple one that you can print off in a brochure type of, of um, handout, and then you can um, go over it with your patient and write in things or change things if you, if you would like. So that's just one of several that are out there. Um, and of course, if you download these slides, you can um, hit those links and get onto those um, resources. Okay, additional training resources. So the domestic and sexual violence, the impact on health and the patient safety card approach to integrated education assessment and response. That is the three-part webinar series that fulfills the mandatory clinical training required in IHS policies. And of course, IHS policy, you can go onto our IHM and you can, um, you know, steal those policies and use them or change them, however it fits your facility. Um, you're always welcome to do that. They're, they're available to the public. But this is one training that is, um, you know, if you download these slides, this will be a link to that training. But that uh, document is also listed down here in the other documents. And it's, the CLEZ IPV, so um, IPV training that has the 41 kilobyte one, that will lead you to um, the registration page for that. And that comes with CEUs up to for another year, December 2020 is when the CEU stops being given out and then we'll have to renew it. But I also want to um, give your attention to the Tribal Forensic Healthcare website. I have a couple of slides that go more in depth, but there is, um, we have about 58 different um, webinars now, and one of them I want to highlight was the evolution of the danger assessment and just some of the changes that was going. That was only a one hour one. There also is a three and a half hour um, course that is going to be available November 21st, and that's actually a certification course for the, the tool. We also have IPV screening on demand course. That course actually shows 
staff, so if you have a new staff or staff that haven't actually been trained on how to document IPV, it goes through the RPMS thing um, and how to document um, both the exam code and the IPV education code. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the grammar part of this this um, presentation, but it actually walks them through on how to do that. So that is, and that's a one hour course, and it is available on this Tribal Forensic Healthcare website. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit more about our Tribal Forensic Healthcare. It's, fun, it's a funded educational platform access, and there's a link for it. We offer on demand online courses, and we archive all of our um, quarterly webinars. We also do have the 44-hour 40, sexual assault nurse examiner course, which is open to RNs, PAs, FNCs, MPs, and ODs to take and to be a forensic examiner. And then we also have many other courses that are open to all behavioral health professionals. We have we have a, a variety of people that take our, our other courses, such as the IPG screening, the suspect exam, forensic photography, um, and the creation of start in tribal communities. We have advocates and federal prosecutors that get on here and just take these for the general knowledge. Um, there is the EOEs offered with the ones that are released within the past two years. Um, this just talk a little bit more about our um, sexual assault examiner courses. Our new round of courses are starting up November 17th and they fill up fast. So usually within the first two weeks, you have, um, they're usually filled up, but every two months there's a new round of courses that are open. So this very first course, you have to take the sexual assault examiner course to take the pediatric course or the intimate partner violence examiner course, which those are available for free for anybody serving the American Indian Alaska Native population. And then we also have in-person clinical skills experiences available around the country too, if they actually want to go to a setting and, and practice those skills before they are, um, you know, go back home and, and, and start in on the clinical forensic um, practices. And then we have monthly pediatric peer review virtual meetings. So we go over actual cases and discuss them in a professional setting, a secure setting. So if you want to participate or if you have staff that would like to participate in those, um, please email me and I will um, set you up with information on how you can get on, on our peer review. Is there any questions so far about the clinical tools? And if you have, if you think of anything, um, if you can't find one of those tools or, or you want to discuss different tools a little bit more, um, you can always feel free to email me as well. So I, we went over some of the GIFRAMA um, measures in the previous, um, our, our session web. But I did want to go over this um, again and maybe if, you had any questions about this, you could um, ask those questions and I could maybe specifically, you know, talk about um, issues that you you as a UIO organization are concerned with. Um, I may not be um, aware of some of your um, barriers that you're having. So at any time you can um, join in and, and just ask a question if, if you want something specific to be addressed. So, um, and I might go please, over some of these slides because um, I believe that Christine did a really good job of talking about the difference between like the GIFRA measures and the GIFRAMA measures, um, and which IPV is actually a GIFRAMA measure. And so it's submitted to OMB and Congress and included in the Annual Health and Human Services Online Performance Appendix. So this is the one of the of the um, measures that kind of gives an overview um, of more than just IHS. I'm gonna stop and maybe Diane can kind of explain a little bit better. Um, we did talk about what, how do you get credit for the ICD-GIFRAMA measure? So there's, there's three different ways actually. 
or several different ways actually. You could actually do the ICD DV screening, um, which is in jam code 34. I think in the very first um, polling that most of the UIOs were still using RTMS, the EHR. So that exam code 34 is specific to those that are using RTMS. If you have gone, if your facility has gone to an off-the-shelf um, documentation system, this exam code might not be available to you. And, and as well as some of the education codes are specific to RPMS and IHS. Um, there, I, as far as I've been finding out is that some of the off-the-shelf systems do offer for an extra fee for these to be configured. And I don't, um, I'm not familiar with, you know, the expense of that or the feasibility of that for different organizations. So if that's something that you're concerned with, um, please um, speak up and, and maybe we have other people on the line that have to know a little bit more about that. So um, the ITGDV screening can be accomplished through exam code 34, DHS ITGDV exam. So, and this on EHR is the one that in the Tribal Forensic Healthcare, the one hour ITV screening course, it shows you how to document on there. Um, the ITV DV related diagnosis. So, if, if the patient was actually diagnosed with domestic violence or intimate partner violence using any one of these codes or these SNOMED data sets, but in the problem list only, or the DHS POV 43 or 44, you then get credit for um, the ITD measure. Then also just doing the ITD DV patient education as a universal education for any of the patient, edu patient education codes ending in domestic violence. Um, on, if you're an RPMS um, EHR site, any one of those codes is going to put you to the positive. So um, some of the highest scoring um, facilities and areas in, for the ITV measure is because they use education as to meet that, that ITV. They just really have gotten into universal education and they, they may not do, use a screening tool at all, um, which of course, you know, I, I recommend that you do pick a screening tool and you do have it available. But many are doing very well just doing universal education and documenting that um, using these education codes. Um, and then the ITV DV counseling, the PLD ITV9 and um, these codes, if you use any one of these codes, you also get credit. So these manuals, if you download the slides um, and you, you use these links, it will take you to the manuals where I got that information. They're, they're technical, they're very good, and they go through um, uh, all of your questions or, or the how-to of um, documenting this measure. Some possible actions, these are clinical actions to reach goals. You know, our goal, our DeGrama um, cutoff is 41.6. It wasn't moved this year from last year. So, um, and we are uh, nationally, we were coming in, you know, under the goal again this year. Um, a lot of that has to do with our ability to actually um, get the data or our, our, our practices and, and get credit for those practices in sites that are non-RPMS. Um, but some clinical things that you can do is, is doing this university RTV education and adopting that practice, having those those patient education resources to hand to your patients, and then just and really hammering it during influenza immunization clinics, the physical exams, like it says, those sports physicals. If your clinic is doing those, maybe you know have an agreement among all your nurses, providers, or um, MSAs, but this is one of the things we're going to address for every sports physical is dating violence or healthy relationship um, factors. Pediatric immunization clinics and for not only, you know, if they're an adolescent, you would obviously, if they're 14 year old, you would give them the ITV education, but for the parents and screening the parents during those clinics. 
targeted ICD screening and education for all STD testing and treatment, repeat treatment, pregnancy evaluation, and emergency contraceptive repeat use. Um, it would be a very good time to address ICD screening or universal education, and then any drug or alcohol abuse positive. So technical act actions to reach goals. Ensure that your Zipper community is accurate. There is, um, and in, in the UIO setting, there is um, some technical um, issues with your population area that that aren't uh, that haven't been resolved right now. And um, maybe Diane can talk with you more about that. Um, I don't have all the information on that and, and some of the possible resolutions to those problems. But if that is a problem um, for your facility, we can talk more about that. And then contacting technical advisors with MDW to ensure that data capture is getting credit for all screening, diagnosis, and education, and how to um, upload that data if you're not using RPMS. Um, and then just using ICARE or RPMS to identify all missed opportunities and perform outreach, outreach to those patients. I also just wanted to try just one more maybe polling question. Um, Mark, can you poll the question about um, performance improvement? It's a really good idea to um, um, consider having your IPV um, screening or your intervention um, or outreach to patients as a performance improvement project. I was just wondering if, if any of your organizations right now have any performance improvement um, projects related to, or chart audits related to IPV screening or IPV intervention. So most of you aren't doing it, so I do want to take a lot of time. I know we're running out of time, but, but consider that as a performance improvement project if, if, or a chart audit to see if it should be a performance improvement project. Um, that's something that um, could be a part of your performance improvement and or your quality plan as part of your accreditation, especially in our population with a high risk of IPV. Um, and violence and trauma in our population, this would be a good option um, to improve your GIPRA results or just your screening and interventions, the efficiency of your um, interventions that you're employing with your patients. All right, well, we'll, we'll end that poll. And then I just wanted to leave you with, So assistance with training. So urban facilities needing additional information or training to contact. And I, I just put your um, some several contact information for the if you download the slides, this will link to the IHS IT support and the natural national GIPRA support team. And we have a couple of names here and some um, outreach numbers. And then, of course, any questions or if you would need to discuss further, if you need help um, even looking and exploring more of the screening tools, I'm happy to help with policy. Um, I, I may even be able to um, throw out a couple different policies to your facility that may work or you may want to um, start from, so you don't have to start from scratch. So just reach out to me at um, my email. I also have a list of for forensic healthcare that we often talk and share information and um, training and funding opportunities through the listserv. So um, be sure to sign up to that listserv and um, be a part of our ongoing conversation. If you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat box or um, I, I'm not sure if they, their speakers can be unmuted if they have questions, Mark. Um, so far, no questions in the participant chat box. Uh, 
we can keep it open a, a few more moments though. It's that's no problem. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I encourage you to download any of the documents and um, partake in that danger assessment um, training that's coming up on November um, 21st, as well as the, the three hour trainings um, that, or the one hour training for ICD screening as well. With, with, thank you, everyone. Though we met, went a few minutes long, I'm, I appreciate your patience. Again, the participant chat box uh, will be open a few seconds longer. Feel free to download the slides or the, or the presentation, the handouts here in the presentation slides. We'll make the slides available uh, later, and this uh, presentation has been recorded. It too will be uh, available from our website in uh, sometime um, uh, a few weeks uh, from now. The Knowledge Resource Center will have this recording archived and available for, for others uh, through our um, UIL uh, uh, website and, and pages through the, the NICUI uh, homepage. Uh, again, I, I appreciate your attending our second in the, the Behavioral Health uh, Community of Learning series. And um, we'll keep the chat box open just a little while longer, but we ask that once you uh, are done either with your downloads, you please uh, hang up and, and, and exit the presentation room so that we can uh, close out. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Mark, for um, setting up the whole webinar. You're very oh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Erica, for a very informative presentation.